All right. Okay, says we're live. Good afternoon, everyone. There is a 20 second delay. I just wanted to tell you that. But in the chat, if you could let us know if we are live, if you can see us, if you can hear us, um, and if the video quality and audio quality is good. We did have some issues with the last live stream, but I think um, it turned out to be the other uh, person who had the issue. It looks like we are live. So. All right, guys, welcome to today's live stream. A lot of you are already watching. You're already here. We are excited to have you. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, if you're on YouTube, there is a live chat, and you can ask questions and mingle with others. Yes, they're starting to come in. You can hear us. You can see us. Um, and then we do have a couple of moderators with us today, but if for some reason um, they are not able to get to the craziness in the chat, um, just throw up a hand and I'll make you a moderator as well. We had some lots of bad things, comments in the last <laughs> live stream. So we want to take care of that this time. All right. So we are only going to keep you guys for an hour today. I'm going to introduce our, our guys today. Everybody pretty much knows who you are, but I'm going to take just a quick second for both of you to introduce yourselves. Um, before that, we basically wanted to do this live stream. I asked Joel and John to join me today because it was kind of mind blowing. Last week we were talking about the Amos Miller case and a lot of you, you know, had lots of questions about what is food freedom. And it was kind of, you know, interesting to see so many homesteaders that didn't really understand how freedom in America works, especially when it comes to our food system. So um, we are going to go over that. We're going to talk about what food freedom looks like, what's constitutional, not constitutional, um, not necessarily just about the Amos Miller case, but about, you know, food freedom in general. And then how do we communicate with our government and how do we make changes and where do we go to do those things? So I'm going to get started. Go ahead, John. Why don't you introduce yourself real quick um, since you're kind of the, uh, you're the new guy in some ways to our community. So go ahead. Yeah, so I'm John. Um, I've been involved with food and farming and homesteading and local food since around 2004. Um, I guess in terms of the food freedom side, especially, um, the Kentucky Department of Health at the behest of the federal government raided our local food buying club back in 2011. And up until that time, pretty much everyone else the government raided had lost. Right. So there's this long string of farmers and businesses and whatnot. The government had closed down and we were the first people to actually beat the government when they came to put an enforcement action on us. Um, and then I spent a few more years with Joel and some others helping some other farmers beat the government and engaging in some targeted um, civil disobedience to get the government to change some of its policies. So, so on the food freedom side, um, Joel and I have been fighting this battle for a while and kind of watching, you know, it slowly unfold and it's various twists and turns over the past two decades. Right. And you are the organizer of the Rogue Food Conference, which is a pretty big deal that you left out. <laughs> and so HOA is a sponsor of the Rogue Food Conference. You guys had your first event this year in Tennessee and they have another one coming up at Polyface in August, right? Or is it August yeah, two or weeks and two days. That's right. Okay, there we go. All right, so Joel, tell us just a brief bit about yourself, and then we will get started. Sure, I'm Joel Salatin. Our farm, uh, I, with my family, we farm a Polyface Farm here in Virginia. Uh, we've been in this space, a, a brand selling a direct marketed branded product, and um, if you want to get my my take in this sphere, um, I wrote a book. Uh, I don't know how long ago, what, 12 years ago, maybe everything I want to do is illegal. And it articulates the battles we've had with the food police. Uh, we've won a few, some of them we've opted not to, not to fight. They're just not worth it. You can't fight everything that's worth fighting, but, uh, but in general, we want to cultivate a direct farm to consumer, um, uh, you know, food and fiber commerce. And, um, 
And so anything that we can do to facilitate that, that direct to not only build connections, but also to enable the farm retail dollar and wear the middleman hats, the, the, the processor, the marketer, the distributor, uh, then very, very, very small outfits can make a full-time living uh, or, or, or a supplemental uh, side hustle to your town job uh, if you can actually get retail, retail dollars. So it's, it, it's about uh, not only just building connections emotionally and, and for food security, but primarily to, uh, to create more income potential on a homestead or a small farm. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining me today because you are two of the leading experts in, in this topic. And so that's why I wanted to have you both. You're also both speakers at the Homesteaders of America event that we have coming up in Virginia um, this October. So to get started, we have a, a couple of people asking specifically, is there a very condensed version, probably Joel, since you're friends with Amos or you know him well, um, of the Amos Miller case that's kind of setting off this conversation today? What happened and um, what is happening and how can we kind of break that down a little bit? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know all the background, but I know that Amos Miller had an agreement with, uh, you know, he was trying to sell, he, he, has a, he has a customer base that are trying to buy things and um, he was going through custom, custom processing. Uh, so if you're <laughs> to, uh, to unpack that whole inspection versus custom, uh, there's basically three levels of government uh, intervention in the meat space. And the government, uh, the government parses out poultry. Poultry is not meat, just, just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> and so, um, so he was marketing into this space and, um, and, and he'd gotten, he'd, he'd gotten uh, sideways of some of these rules and regulations. Federal inspection is there's a federal inspector on the kill floor, looking through all the organs, looking through every animal, signing off that this is an animal fit for human consumption. State inspection is the same thing, except it can't cross the state line. And custom is, is a facility that only processes your animal for you to take back home with you. Now there is a loophole that, that I can sell that animal live and put my customer's name on it right. and take it down. And, and uh, you know, that, that customer then handles the, the processing as a custom thing. So those are kind of the three things in meat. Well, Amos, uh, because he'd gotten sideways, he signed an agreement apparently. Uh, and and I, I may go, uh, John, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, apparently he signed some sort of an agreement with the government agents that uh, that gave him a certain period of time to comply. Uh, he was getting his animals custom uh, processed in a custom house and selling and selling that meat. Um, and he did not comply within that time period. And so the government has come in and gotten him for you know uh, uh, basically contempt of court, if you will, uh, and, and 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 reneging on the the deal that he signed. And that's why there's a $250,000 fine and jail time if he doesn't pay the fine in 30 days. Um, this has been six years in the making. I, th I think the important thing for everybody to understand here, it, we, we, can, we can drill down into the, the little nitty gritty of the case, uh, which I may not be as familiar with as you might think. But, but um, the main thing to remember is this has been six years developing. And so those those people who are who are timid, who are concerned, well, you know, I don't want to get a quarter million dollar fine, go to jail, blah blah blah. Look, those things develop very very slowly. They develop over time, and so that's why I think John would agree with me that it's okay to push the envelope because nobody's going to throw you in jail. Nobody's going to give you a fine day one. They're gonna they're gonna give you a cease and desist. They're going to tell you you have to change your change your uh, protocol. They're going to get you to sign a paper or something. But there is going to be a long there, there's a long uh, 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 a group of things that have to happen before you end up like Amos Miller. And I, I, right now, I'm I'm not going to defend him, and I'm not going to uh, prosecute him. Let's not try him on this program. Um, but uh, the, the thing to remember is this was six years in brewing 
And so there, there, there were there were other paths that could have been taken. We could do the what ifs. We could do well. He should have. We could do that all day. But it took six years to get to this point. That's a long time for for attention to develop. Right. And so one of the things with Amos was that he apparently, I guess, he did try to use. Uh, an FDA facility, but they were spraying down the meat with a chemical that he did not like. So do you want to tap on that for a sec? You know, in that case, what does someone do? If, if you can't find a process or a facility, is, is there a way to ask them not to do that? Are they required to do that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think Amos's big mistake was signing a paper. Right. Uh, um, and and, and in, in the in the, uh, the raid that we've had here when bureaucrats have come to us and shoved a piece of paper in front of us and said, sign here, we have never signed one. Uh, that's that's a, a blanket policy for me. Those, those papers, you know, th they, they do it with a smile. They do it conciliatory. You know, we're not gonna mess with you if you just sign this, you know, it, it so all sounds good, but buried in that paper is always some sort of a, of, of a leverage of a leverage that, that you don't have if you don't sign away and say, I agree with you. And so I, I think I think in this case, if Amos had never signed the paper and just went to the courtroom and said, look, I have two options. I can have it sprayed with chemicals and be in your system, or I can have it not sprayed with chemicals and not be in your system. And by conviction of Almighty God, you know, I I am not going to have this meat sprayed down. If, if he had done that just on a, on a moral basis without having signed that paper, he probably would have had a much higher, you know, a, a much better standing. And right. and that that that's my sense of it. So my encouragement to folks is, don't sign a paper. <laughs> yeah, you know, to weigh in on a few of the details of how Amos ended up where he is. This is something Joel and I have talked about for years. Is there such a thing as private food? So do you, do you have the ability to opt out of the public food safety system? You know, and so Amos, the way he structured his business is you became a member of his private farm group. Right. Um, and so the part of the big challenge we have right now, legally, legislatively, and otherwise, is establishing that people have a right to opt out of that system, to get food privately, involuntarily, that the government hasn't had to stamp, hasn't had to spray, hasn't had to do whatever to, to make it, you know, safe. Right. Um, and and that's, that's really the challenge is, Amos has all of these willing customers all over the country, um, but because they're not right by him, he's having to ship. Mm -hmm. So, and he doesn't want to send them to, you know, like chicken. Um, most chicken in America goes through like a triple chlorine chemical bath and it still comes out over half of it says consumer reports tainted with pathogenic bacteria. And so there's people like Joel and me and Amos who are like, we can do better, but we have to have the, the space and the freedom and the opportunity to show we don't need all these chemicals. We don't need a $20 million facility with a dozen different chemicals nobody can pronounce or understand right. to safely feed people. And the government doesn't like anybody showing that that's possible. It, it, it makes their corporate sponsors look bad. <laughs> Well, and so that bears the question then as we, you know, with all of the craziness in the United States, what's constitutional and what's not constitutional? And at that point, if you, you know, Amos's case was, well, he doesn't feel like the government pursuing him was constitutional, that he had the right to make this decision because of the constitution. What would you say, how do we navigate that? Well, uh, <laughs> 
you know, there are a lot of constitutional uh, attorneys, and of course, you know, they they, they make their living uh, looking at the Constitution. But um, if anybody has a chance to to Google up probably the best talk I've seen on this recently, there's a lady named uh, Chris Ann who has who has uh, done a, a wonderful one hour presentation um, about the constitutionality of this. Basically, she takes the position. You've got you've got four hierarchies of authority: God, man, society, and government. And um, and what what are our um, you know? And everybody reads the reads the Constitution or the as as inalienable rights. Actually, these are these are unalienable rights. A lien is what a what a bank puts on your mortgage until you've paid for it. And so these are rights that nobody can put a a, a lien on and nobody can, nobody can take them. It's not you're alienated from them. It's, it, it's nobody can put a lien on them, life, liberty, and property. And, and the constitution is a, is a contract. It's a compact between the states. It's not between the government and the people. If you read it, it says ratified by the states, not the people. So anytime, anytime that there is a, an action that is beyond the scope of that contract, then it's an it's an unauthorized option. In other words, the, the criminality in this is not the person. The criminality is this is is on the part of the government that has not that has reneged on its compact. You know, we, we hear this all the time about well, the Constitution is a living, breathing document. Well, how would you how would you like to have a contract with your employer on your wages and your uh, your, your working hours? And, uh, and your employer comes to you and says, well, really, really, uh, that's a living, breathing document, you know. Uh, uh, I'm not really going to honor the hours and the, the, the protocols for your work assignment. The, actually, this is a living, breathing document. You know, contracts are contract, and it specifies delegated powers. And so, so basically it says that anything not delegated to the states um, or not delegated to the federal government. The, the whole idea of the Constitution is a compact between the states. That's who ratified, not the federal government. The states ratified it to protect themselves from overreach of the federal government. And, and so, so one of our big problems right now is that the federal government has essentially created extortion among the, if, if you don't let us do this, we're going to cut off your funding or we're going to you know, do this, that or the other. And so rather than states nullifying, nullifying a, an overreach of, of power, a criminal overreach of power on the part of the federal government uh, and viewing and appreciating their authority as a, as a, uh, as a security barrier between the federal government and the people, the states have now come alongside the federal government. We're going to be your best partner. And so inst instead of being a security fence, they're actually a partner in crime. And so, so when, when the, the government officials usurp their contract abilities, that contract of authority is no more valid than any other uh, uh, contract of authority. And we see this, Amy, biblically uh, in that there are numerous times when people um, uh, from from the you know from the midwives in Israel during it, the Egyptian uh, you know uh, uh, Egyptian slavery to Shadrach Meshach and Abednego to uh, you know uh, Paul and Silas to don't preach in this name. Uh, there are numerous examples uh, where it is better to please God than man. And right. so if you keep this hierarchy in mind, um, you know God. <clears throat> man, society, and government, that hierarchy, uh, it helps to parse out the relative levels of authority within this. Yeah. Yeah. And then that was a question too. We had some people, and that's two different people looking at it too. You know, you have people looking at the constitution, the bill of rights as you know, not from a Christian standpoint, then you have those who do look at it from a Christian standpoint. So it's hard to navigate. That's kind of a loaded question that you could probably have an entire hour to talk about, but it was good to touch on it because that was a question that we kept getting. Um, essentially, the question is, in America, what should food freedom look like? How, how should it work? Because a lot of people are really confused. You know, they think, you know, 
so for example, in Virginia, as you know, you can't buy raw milk unless it's, it's in a herd share. And so the question was, could meat be done the same way, which it is through, you know, quarter of a cow, half a cow. But then is the line drawn when, you know, Amos or someone else starts selling out into the community surpassing that? Should that be something that the federal government regulates or should it not be? Is, is, are these people choosing, since he had a customer base, since they're choosing to buy that product, is it ultimately up to them or should it still be government regulated? I think that was the question a lot of people had is, is it right or is it not right? Or is there no definitive answer on that? Well, I'll, I'll let John jump on this. I, I might add something, but I'll let John take this one first. You know, like how you see something is right or wrong comes out of your worldview. Right. I, in, you know, where I sit, I don't see why people should not have the ability to buy food without government interference. It is something people have done for six, seven, eight thousand or more years. It, 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 it's, it's one of the amazing things living in America is a lot of the regulations we see in America have been around for 80 years or less. Right. And people act like the entire universe would cease to function if we did not have these regulations in place. You know, so years ago, I was working on a piece of legislation in Kentucky and our bill sponsor um, was facing a lot of pushback from the dairy industry because the dairy industry was saying, everybody will die if people can get their food directly from farmers. Mm -hmm. And so our bill sponsor got up in the Kentucky Senator House, can't remember which one it was at this point. And he goes, I want a show of hands of everyone in this room who grew up drinking raw milk. And it was two thirds of, what other, of whatever chamber of the Kentucky you know, legislator at that time. And he goes, so two thirds of you and your families survived growing up on unexpected milk. And you're now telling me that it's going to destroy the entire Commonwealth. It, it's, it's just madness. So, you know, I think for Joel and I, what would food freedom look like? Um, you know, people should have the right and the opportunity to directly get whatever foods they want from whatever provider they want with whatever level of inspection that they want to have that transaction to have. So if they want an inspector to inspect the farm, they should be able to do that if they want that and if the farmer wants that. If they wanna be their own inspector, they should be able to do that. If they don't want anybody to inspect it and they just trust the farm, you know, so. So people should have the opportunity and ability though to make that decision themselves and not have a decision foisted upon them um, that also I think the statistics shows doesn't actually make them safe and it doesn't make the food safe. It gives them the illusion, you know, f you know security theater safety. The, the other thing, Amy, if I could add a little bit on there, um, People who know me know that I have long advocated for a, a, um, a food emancipation proclamation. I know that's loaded terminology, but, but essentially to take the shackles of slavery off of our current food system uh, in which we do, not, we do not enjoy choice. And if you read, it, it's amazing how many of these judges' rulings now we have in writing where judges say very categorically, Americans do not have uh, uh, the right to the food of their choice, right. and that's a powerful that's a powerful uh, position for jurisprudence to say that I can't choose what my body fuel is going to be. Um, uh, you talk about uh, uh, an invasion of privacy. For the government to tell me uh, what I can and cannot ingest is actually a powerful thing. And, and it's really a charade, and I'll tell you why. Because everything else that's a hazardous substance has a prohibition on both 
use and sale. In other words, if, if, um, if the DEA, uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, comes to my house and finds cocaine, even if I tell them, well, this is for my own use, I'm not selling it, I can't use it. Uh, uh, if, if I have drug prescription drugs and I don't have a prescription for them, it doesn't matter that I'm just using them for my own good. I can't have those. So in, ha in and I don't want to get a debate about you know the drug wars and all that. All I'm suggesting is that in hazardous substances, um, there's a, there's a very clear prohibition on both the private use and the sale of that substance. But in food, food is the only one where we have defined hazardous substances like uninspected meat, raw milk. We have these hazardous substances, but the prohibition is not on acquisition. If I want, if, if I can acquire it, I can use it freely. I can, I can feed it to my children. I can have a neighborhood picnic and give it to everybody. That's perfectly fine. The prohibition is only on one side of the transaction and that's on the seller. So if, if it were really hazardous, if it were actually consistently hazardous, the prohibition should be both on use and sale, but in food, it's not. So clearly it's not hazardous. It is actually a prohibition on market access. It's not about safety, it's market access. And so then it becomes simply a, a market manipulative intervention on the part of the government to decide what can and cannot come to the marketplace. So what we have here is, is, is choice and voluntarism overridden by this, this notion that uh, if we allow choice, if we allow personal responsibility, if we allow voluntarism to occur, then, I mean, I've been told by inspectors here in Virginia, if we allow that to happen, if we allow people to, to make their choice, we can't build hospitals fast enough for all the sick people that are going into hospitals because we all know farmers can't be trusted, they cheat and they make dirty food. And, right. and that, 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 that is a massive assumption on the part of bureaucrats who frankly do spend most of their time in big companies that are trying to cheat and bend the rules and, 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 and have, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, skeletons in the closet. And, and so, uh, so our, 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 we come back again to the problem that, that right now, as, as John so eloquently said, you know, all this stuff is literally in the last 80 years. How did we survive before this? And the problem is now our memories are so short, our memories are so short that we haven't had food freedom for so long that it's become ingrained and entrenched in our psyche and, and the problem is those of us who believe in this, there's not a mechanism. There's not a mechanism in place to allow a jurisdiction to say, well, we're gonna try food freedom for a bit. And, and let's see if everybody gets sick. Let's see if all farmers are shysters. So Maine, Sedgwick, Maine tried this several years ago and did the food sovereignty law. It was just a half a page that said within the jurisdictions of this, of this uh, uh, township, Eaters, uh, uh, buyers, and 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 food producers and processors can do business and transact food commerce without any government intervention whatsoever. You want to make a pound cake? You want to make a, a, a chicken pot pie? Sell it to your neighbors? You can do that. Now you can't ship it outside the jurisdiction, but within our jurisdiction, we're going to have food freedom. Quickly, five other jurisdictions copied that from Sedgwick, Maine. Well, then the whole state got onto it. Maine then finally passed it. As, as in, in Maine, uh, unfortunately, it got so watered down, it didn't include uh, meat and dairy, which were, of course were the, you know, the, the biggest, and you can always sell a tomato, right? Um, and so it got watered down. But what happened was the federal government was so uh, angry that that movement had even gotten a toehold in Maine that, the, that the, uh, the, the USDA called Maine the day the government signed it and said, we're going to eliminate all federal inspection from Maine. Maine, you won't be able to move one item of meat, poultry, or dairy outside of Maine if you don't rescind this. Immediately they rescinded it, and now we're back to, you know, we're back to where we were. So this is the power at play, the, the, the threat, the threat of true uh, food choice and I'm using choice more than freedom. I think it's a more powerful word because, you know, 
we we're we're now free to choose. We're free to choose our our our, our sexual identity. We're free to choose, you know, uh, whether to uh, abort a baby or not. We're free. Think about the things we have choice for, and yet we're not allowed to choose our food. Really? Right. Yeah, it's the going joke in Virginia right now is that marijuana is is legal, but raw milk is <laughs> illegal. You know, and, and it, it's insane. And so <clears throat> that brings us to the next portion of this is. People really want to know, how do we change it? And, and I know that's a loaded question too, but let's kind of break it down a little bit. So the first thing is, you know, in the case of someone like Amos Miller or the, the main incident that you're talking about, um, how do people organize? What's the proper way to do that and make a change locally first, obviously, um, and then spread out from there? And more importantly, the biggest question was, is there a place, a person, or an organization that kind of helps us pull this all together? Um, and, and how does it work? Because people we're finding, especially in the homesteading community, especially in the HOA community, that they're ready. They've, they've reached that point where they're like, okay, if we don't do something now, it's over. And so I literally have people begging me on Instagram and Facebook, tell us what to do. They're getting mad at me. Tell us what to do because we need to do something. We, we have to do something. So what is your answer to that? And I'd love to hear both of you on this one. Well, I, I know, I know, uh, Amy, that John is going to be, uh, he's going to be way too humble to uh, promote the Rogue Food Conference since he's kind of in charge of it. So I'm gonna promote it first instead. And, 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 and that is, uh, this was a brainchild that uh, John and I uh, conceived a couple of years ago. And, um, and, and the whole idea is to provide a, um, a, a fellowship community, a, a tribe, if you will, of where um, those of us who believe in this food freedom uh, idea can can get together and we can encourage each other and we can and we can bring together the best examples of people who are um, who are practicing this and uh, thumbing thumbing their noses right at these uh, at these usurping tyrants at these unconstitutional tyrants and so um, uh, so you know yeah uh, um, this is new it's in its infancy. I mean, these movements take a while, but I can tell you, uh, I'm getting chill bumps even as I talk, this thing's got legs. This thing's got legs. And um, we're doing a, a second one this year, and we've already been asked to come to Florida, Texas. I can imagine, I can imagine doing these, um, you know, if, if these were as big and common as the NRA and Trump rallies, uh, we would have a different country. I, I have said all along that if, 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 if we had this food freedom, if people were as concerned about food freedom as they were about gun freedom, and, 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 I, and I'm, a, I, I'm a member of the NRA, okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not dissing the NRA, but, but I, I, do, I, do, uh, I do have a lot of you know, personal consternation and frustration that people seem far more interested in, in, in gun freedom than food freedom. And, um, and, and why not have both? Right. Uh, and, and I, and so, uh, so the road and, and, and there are discussions in the rogue food, uh, conference community of creating an entity, uh, that will, you know, that will, um, you know, come alongside and offer legal and political and lobbying help. And, um, and, and I do, I do think that there is a lot of merit in simply, you know, being a contrarian, our, our motto is circumvention, not compliance. When it gets this bad, often the cost of circumvention is less than the cost of compliance. That's kind of where we are now. I'll let John take it from there. Yeah. Um, so there's, especially since you brought up the gun thing, there's a quote from Henry Kissinger, who was a really famous foreign policy person. And Kissinger, his quote's really well known because he says, if you control the food, you control the people. And, you know, he didn't say if you control guns, you control the people. Because at the end of the day, like, you can't eat bullets. Right. <laughs> so, 
you know, it, it's just like, um, you know, I love the second amendment. I'm an avid shooter. I teach self-defense to people. I train multiple martial arts, but it kills me in the community that people care so little about their ability to choose food. Because if you have no food, what good do all those guns do? They just, right. you know, historically the biggest way they got rid of contrarians was starve them out, <laughs> uh, you know, not shoot them. It's much easier to surround them and, and wait till they have no food left. Um, to the original question, what can people do? The first thing you do is every day your family eats two, three, or if you have six kids like me, it's a never ending buffet. It feels like around the house. Um, and the first thing you do to make a change is make that change in your own household. Who are you getting your food from? Where are you getting your food? And what votes are you casting with that 10 to 15% of your family budget? And I understand it's not always convenient to support an alternative enterprise. Um, it might be a little bit more expensive to support a local farmer. But, you, you know, that economic change is what helps set up success on the legislative and judicial side. I love the Constitution. But for all intents and purposes, the Constitution is a piece of toilet paper. Um, you know, it, it does not guarantee anymore any of the things it really says. The people who have actually won these battles, like our buying club, um, like Vernon Hirschberger in Wisconsin, I'm trying to think, you know, Max Kane in Wisconsin, Pete, you know, places that have won had lots of grassroots support that was willing to fight this battle so that one single person didn't have to do it alone. Right. You know, so I always joke like with our buying club, um, I'm kind of skinny. If I go to jail, I'm going to end up with a cellmate named Bubba. Um, <laughs> if I'm going to jail, I'm taking my cellmates with me rather than the warden choosing who my cellmate is. Uh, you know, so, so I tell them, you know, vote with your dollars and vote in your counties and your localities especially by your choices and by who you're networking with and who you're supporting. Another big area that is a two for one for homesteaders is the crack in the regulatory pavement around cottage food laws. And so almost every state in the country has cottage food laws Institute for Justice has been doing a fabulous job um, cracking open those cracks bigger and bigger every chance they get. Um, and, and that's something people can support at their state level is because in a real way, cottage food laws are the most freedom oriented legislation being pushed around America over right. the past decade. Um, and, and basically what they do is, is they continue to expand things that don't fall under the bureaucratic purview, whether it's jams or breads or this or that. And um, was it Wyoming, Joel, that, that you know, basically has one of the most expansive cottage food, food freedom bills on the books um, that I think includes everything up to meat and dairy. Um, because the, the federal government is is willing to go a lot further on those two product categories in terms of punishing states that try and get those exempted. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and as a practical matter, I would just add, uh, John, those are wonderful. Uh, as a practical matter, realize that there are a lot of, uh, there are things that you can do um, and this is not just food. There are things that you can do. For example, I ran into somebody where they were, um, they supposedly um, built an illegal pond. Uh, it was a, you know, homestead and they built this pond and the government said, you can't build a pond. And, uh, and, and they called the pond um, a, a, a fire suppression reservoir. And, and, and calling it a fire suppression reservoir in a fire prone area 
uh, garnered a lot of political support. We <laughs> want fire suppression reservoirs. The, the, the urban people don't know it's another name for a pond. All they know is, oh, here's somebody trying to not have fires. Yeah. And so what you do is, look, Amy, all this stuff is political. This stuff is not, empir it's not empirical. You're not going to kill somebody with uninspected chick chicken. You're not going to kill somebody, you know, with some of your homemade moldy cheese. Even if it's moldy, you're not going to kill anybody. All right, and 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 so so we're not talking about uh, uh, you know a, a food safety issue here. And so so if you can name it something different, call it something different that actually garners public support. You fight these things out in the in the public arena, okay, and and you garner to yourself people in the public arena, and so you you know you don't call your chicken pasture chicken, you call it you call it um, uh, uh, cl cl climate climate change, um, you know uh, climate climate change. Uh, s slowing, slowing, slowing climate change chickens. I mean, here I am, you know, I'm trying to just brainstorm here off the top of my head, but, but, you, you know, you, you name things that garner, that garner public sentiment and you, and you, you embrace tossing it in to the public sector. When, when the government was trying to shut us down, I had both Democrats and Republicans uh, going to bat for me, elected officials for the Democrats, I presented what we were doing as this is the ultimate environmental food. You know, it, 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 it builds soil and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and for the Republicans, it was entrepreneurial, uh, protecting entrepreneurial. We, we can call it uh, entrepreneurial chicken. OK, uh, the, the point is you, 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 you can create terminology that can get you um, public support. So you cast it into the arena of public debate. Now you're elevated to a place of, of discussion that's not just, well, I'll trade you, I'll trade you one microbe for your two microbes and and in and, and, and debate we call it, you know, bodies on the flow sheet, you know, I'll I'll trade you, you know, two dead cows for one dead chicken and, and all this. And, and you can debate that all day, all day. No, what you've got to do is elevate it to a philosophical, to, to a larger uh, uh, question that moves into a moral and philosophical and, and, and bigger uh, dimension than just, you know, do I have mold or do I have, uh, you know, do I have a, a feather, a feather on the wing? Right. Okay. So a couple more questions. we got about a little less than 20 minutes left. Um, so one of the other questions kind of going along with all of this was from a seller standpoint. So if a homesteader or a farmer is selling product and um, they were to have someone show up from the government stating they've done something wrong, like, you know, for example, John Moody and Joel Salatin, um, you know, there are stories certainly in the community of people never did anything wrong. Even they were even going by the government regulations. What, what's the recommendation process for that? Obviously you there's a certain way you want to do it, um, but you also want to keep your freedom too. And so let's say, let's just give a scenario. If they come to your house, some people say, well, don't let them in. They don't have the right to be there. You know, so what's the process look like for that, for people who are starting to get into this of selling product from their homestead or at farmer's markets? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, different personalities will respond different ways. And uh, John, you can disagree with me. Uh, my, uh, we, we have been very successful at simply, if you don't have a warrant, you're not welcome here. And we've had, during the avian flu outbreak in Virginia, we had these, uh, these government agents show up and they demanded to take blood samples of our chicken out in the pasture. I said, no, you can't get out of your car. Uh, and and um, you, you can't come without, without a warrant. I fully expected them to come back the next day with a warrant, they, ne they never came back. Um, so, so actually, what you have to understand is a lot of these government agents, they don't want a big fight. They've got kids going to soccer games. They go down to the Presbyterian church. You know, I mean, they're, they're not, they're, they're in an evil system, but they're not evil people. And, and so, you, so uh, smile, smile and tell them, no, uh, they're not welcome. And anything they want will be in writing. 
And if they have to put everything in writing, that'll cost them six months. That'll buy you <laughs> six months of time because they're going to have to check it with the attorney general. They understand the ramifications of writing. That makes it legal. Right. So we, we never talk to them. We never talk to them on the phone. We never let them out of their car. They either have a warrant or they send us a letter. And those two things, um, we have a thing going on, right? We've had a thing going on for 18 months. I've been, I've been told, you know, that, that, that these guys are trying to, to contact me, you know, they call the farm and leave messages. Joel called me, you know, the, the food and safety inspection service. They, I'm going to call them. If you want me, send me a letter, you know? And, and so, so you, you can get pretty far just being, uh, being courteous, but, but direct and contrarian. And I always say, look, make them earn every step. Don't bow, make them earn every step. At least make them earn every step. Yeah, you know, partly it depends on what regulations you've subjected yourself to. If an inspector shows up at your door, um, you know, so we have an elderberry business. It got to the point where I really couldn't not be inspected for our elderberry business. So I understand that because I did sign a piece of paper for that business, I have to play by a certain set of rules. Um, whereas like with our buying club, if they show up, you know, when they showed up, we're like, well, you need to leave because you don't have a warrant and you have no jurisdiction here. And, you know, oh, like somebody made a complaint. We'd like to see a copy of the complaint. Oh, the complaint's back at the office. Well, we'll, you know, you can mail us a copy at this address and we want to see the complaint in triplicate before right. we see your face, you know, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different tactics you can take depending on kind of why they're there and what, you know, what the nature of the issue is. Um, Cause again, sometimes it's just, you know, some farmers I know like in Ohio, it's, you, you know, if you have an on farm store, an inspector shows up twice a year and is there for 12 seconds to put a thermometer in your fridge. And he puts a thermometer in the fridge and he writes down the reading and they look around the room and then you don't see them again for another six months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's so many different possible, way, possible reasons they'll show up and possible ways it'll play out. Um, you know, just don't give away the farm when they first walk through the door. As, as Joel said, you know, anytime I deal with an inspector, the first thing I want to know is exactly why they're there and on what basis and authority. And then that will frame how the rest of the interaction goes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, yeah. And, and just so everybody knows that I'm not 100% contrarian. Um, you know, several years ago, I mean, we're under the public law 90-492 uh, poultry exemption for on-farm processing, and uh, inspector showed up. He wanted to pull a water sample from our well. Now, the, the law says that our chicken, the only thing that we're required in, in this exemption is to have chicken that's unadulterated, sanitary and unadulterated. Well, the government took the position that the water we were using was, was, was foundational to whether the product was you know, was, uh, was safe to eat or not, uh, you know, sanitary and unadulterated. And so <clears throat> we submitted, oh, it pains me to say we submitted. We submitted, we submitted to that water sample because we realized that in the court of public opinion, if we, if we were not willing to stand by our water quality, we would lose that fight. We, we, you, you, you simply cannot say, I don't care if my water's any good. Just uh, it, 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 it's, you know, um, than the not. Well, and, and Joel makes a, part, <laughs> Joel well, makes I, a I, great. I, go ahead, go ahead, John. Yeah. Like Joel makes a great point that, you know, we care about food safety. We just don't think arbitrary government inspectors 
looking at 300 chickens whizzing down an industrial line actually makes the food safer. Right. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we more than anyone truly want a safe food system, but a centralized food system, as we saw last year with the meat shortages, a centralized food system is by nature unsafe. It's unsafe food safety wise, because you're bringing all these animals into these single places for processing where when you do have a pathogen, it spreads out of control, but it's just unsafe, you know, nationally, because if you wanted to cripple America, you could um, destroy just like four to six major meat processing plants in America, and we would have meat shortages for the next 18 months across the nation and doubling of meat prices. It, it's crazy. So we want a safe food system. We just think there, you know, we have very, very competing visions of how you get there, but the evidence is on our side. You know, one thing I always loved about Joel is he's like, you know, he's always offered to the regulators in Virginia, come and, come and swab their chickens, go to the local grocery store in Staunton, swab a bunch of chickens, come swab our meat. Let's see whose meat is actually cleaner. Let's have a fair open contest and who see who is really providing the public with clean, safe food. I, I, would, I would like to just segue from that, uh, Amy, if I could just for a second and bring up two other points on this that, um, that, that John alluded to. Um, and that is those of us that are small producers like we are in a branded product in our own businesses, we take food safety very seriously because it's my responsibility. I don't have a bevy of Philadelphia attorneys uh, writing, you know, on, uh, on retainer to protect me from, from you know, from a, a bad food situation. So we take it actually more seriously than the industry that has both the bureaucracy of inspectors and uh, attorneys on retainer to protect them from you know unhappy customers and so so that that inherently creates a protective uh, uh, real-time daily audit if you will a daily audit monitoring just because of the nature of our of, of our transaction that's one number two is if if we want people to exercise their discernment muscles to, un to, to make better food decisions, to understand food better. Uh, you know, discernment is a muscle, uh, just like your biceps or triceps. A and when you, when you do not have to make decisions, you get a lethargic discernment right. muscle. And so when you, when, you in when you create a system in which the individual has to accept responsibility for his decision, then you actually exercise discernment muscles. If the only decision that has to be made is, well, does it have a USDA blue buzz on it? Th there's no decision there. There's no decision on whether the farmer was good or not, whether the product is good or not. It's got USDA stamped on it, it's fine. And so people in, in our society have become extremely ignorant and lethargic about how to actually vet. How do you know whether the food is any good or not? How do you know whether the farmer is any good or not? Well, nobody asks because nobody has to. And, and so, so if, if my goal is an educated, uh, savvy consumer, most of us would say that's what we want, right? right. Uh, then, then how do I get there? Do I get there with more government oversight or do I get there by pulling back a little bit, letting people exercise some freedom and individual choice so that they exercise their discernment muscle? Right. All right, one more question for y'all, and we'll try to keep it short. We got five minutes. Are you prepared? It's crash course. So, um, as most of everyone knows, you know, HOA is a very inclusive organization. We have people from different religions, different beliefs, different political stances. However, um, we do have a large majority of our group that is Christian. And so, one of the questions that we got, and I feel it's perfectly fine to talk about it, um, everyone seems to be understanding, is so in the case of Amos or anyone who's Amish, if you know Amish communities don't believe in necessarily a lot of government regulation, though many of them do it, um, or if people are discerning, you know, in the Bible or through the Bill of Rights or Constitution, what their 
rights as a human is without government interference. What do you say to that? You know, where, where is the line between Christianity and government? How much is too much overreach? And when should you kind of be o- obedient in other words? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, I- I'm going to make some quick reading recommendations for people who like want some good books on this subject. There's the book Slaying Leviathan. Um, there's also Matt Trewella's book, The Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates. Um, so, you know, because you're getting into like a whole world of Christian political philosophy. Right. My personal view is this. Um, there are two times you know, I was trained as a pastor. People ask, how did you end up in Kentucky? I was sent here by my local churches in Ohio to be trained to be a pastor. Um, so that's like my primary vocational calling in life um, that I wasn't old enough to take advantage of. Um, and now I'm almost old enough because now I'm the older man the Bible talks about. <laughs> but so, um, you, you know, so it's a really important question pastorally as a Christian. When can you go toe to toe with the government. Um, The Bible answers this really twofold. The first one that pretty much everyone agrees on is whenever the Bible commands something that's contrary to what it teaches, you're obligated as a Christian to disobey. The second area that we get into debate is what if the government commands something that they do not have the authority to command? And I would say that you are also, as a Christian, out of the law of love, required to disobey. So, you know, like people ask, John, you, you won't wear a mask. And, and I'm like, no, that's not true. There's a couple situations I did wear a mask over the last year. But I don't think the governor of Kentucky has the authority to tell people we should have to wear a mask. Well, why? Because he has not been delegated that authority in the Kentucky Constitution or otherwise. And if I submit to him doing something he doesn't have the authority to do, I'm aiding and abetting him as a lawbreaker. I'm not loving somebody who is running amok of the authority and bounds that have been placed upon them. Um, so, So that's my personal view is anytime the government muscles out of the, you know, as Thomas Jefferson referred to them, the chains of the constitution, you as a Christian, not just have the freedom, but the obligation to pull the chains back more tightly around them. And one reason we find ourselves where we are today is because people refused to re-tighten the chains. And, and now the beast is just running rampant around the room, creating chaos and destruction. Very good. Everybody's like, yes, John, yes. <laughs> All right, Joel. Uh, well, um, I, I, I could say ditto to that. I'll just add that the Bible is quite clear in Romans and in uh, uh, First Peter that the role of government is to be a, an, a, a terror to evil and an encourager of righteousness. And now Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. He didn't say give everything to Caesar, and he didn't say give Caesar everything he asked for. Jesus very specifically said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and then the epistles define that further by saying, um, by saying the, 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 the role of the government is to be a terror to evil and an encourager of righteousness. And so when we, uh, now I'm back to John, uh, agreeing with, uh, when, when we tacitly uh, or, or uh, actively encourage a, a, a an an incentive to evil. That is that is a, a, an inversion uh, of of the authority divinely ascribed to the government, and so what we have now, I think, what we're seeing as we come to the end of this uh, uh, stream. Uh, what we have now is a government that is actually encouraging evil and it is being a a terror to righteousness. 
what can be more righteous than neighbor to neighbor sustenance, intimate sustenance and communion? What can be more righteous than encouraging that? Absolutely. Good stuff, guys. I'm so happy that you joined me today. You'll, you'll like this quote from Pastor Douglas Wilson, since you brought up the verse. Um, he points out that Caesar also does not get to decide what things belong to him. God mm. decides that. So I thought that was, you know, because yeah, like, yeah, that's, like, that's who decides good. what is Caesar's? Well, yeah. that's what God does, not right. Caesar, because Caesar says everything is his. Right, right. That's right. That's right. Amy, Amy, thank you. Thank you for tackling this. This is an, an incredibly uh, um, important topic and, um, and kudos to you for having the courage uh, to the courage to broach it. And I hope this doesn't get censored. <laughs> well, I'm going to record, I'm going to download it. So we'll just blast it everywhere if it does. <laughs> All right, guys, I will let you go. Thank you so much for joining us today. We had well over three, well, about 400 people watching. Um, so it, it's a topic that we, we definitely needed for such a time as this in our community. Um, guys, check out Joel at Polyface Farm and John at Rogue Food Conference. John, I'm really excited to see how HOA and Rogue Food kind of bounce off of each other we've we're doing a lot of the same things but we're doing a lot of different things too and we kind of fill the gaps in and so it's really great to connect with you and have a relationship with you so all right guys thank you all so much we are gonna get off here have a great day thank you